Good morning, Reach. How's everybody doing today? We are so happy that you're here with us. We're excited to be here. If you guys would, let's stand together as we get into a time of worship this morning. We get to raise our hallelujahs to the King of Kings. this one we get to be here together we get to sing praises to Jesus Christ today praise the hallelujah it means praise the Lord let's do that together this morning sing a little louder
for all he's done.
You have no rival. You have no equal. The scripture says that at the name of Jesus, every tongue will confess, every knee will bow. God, would you help us be those people today that our tongues would confess you as Lord, that our knees would drop to the ground, that our hearts would bow in worship. Lord, would you forgive us for where we've tried to put other things or people, um, things in our lives as equal to you. Would you forgive us this morning? Nothing is equal to you. You alone are ruler of all and we give you our hearts this morning, God. Would you reign and rule in this place, in this church, in this community? We give you all the glory, honor, and praise that is due your name. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray and everybody said, amen, amen. It's so good to worship with you. You can go ahead and take a seat for a moment here. Thank you, worship team. My name's Taylor. I get the joy of serving on our staff as our Connect and Teams lead. And this is Foster, strapped to me, taking a nap right now. <laughs> Must be a good life right here. Um, well, if you are in third through fifth grade, thank you so much for joining us for worship. You can uh, dis be dismissed to the back of the room. Your teachers are waving at you there. If you've been checked in, if you haven't checked your third through fifth grade kiddos in yet, but they want to go to class, you can stop by the welcome bar. They can help you out with that. I want to give a warm welcome to everyone in the room who, um, to anyone who might be joining us for the first time today. Uh, way to go. It's like spring break week and you came to church. That's awesome. We're so glad you're here. Um, just hope you're feeling welcome and at home that you can take a deep breath here. Uh, we want to make it really easy for you to connect. And so we've got connect cards in the seat backs in front of you. Uh, you can fill those out at any point during the service today. There's even a spot to let us know on the back how we can be praying with you. We'd love to commit to praying with you this week. And uh, you can drop those in the tech, uh, back by the tech booth. There's two black mailboxes. You can drop those off as you leave today. Well, we're going to make you stand back up to your feet, do some church exercise today, and uh, we'll greet one another for the next couple of minutes.
go so many happy chatty people it's like spring has sprung not the weather today is kind of nice though good to see you guys if you haven't met me yet my name is Andrew Adams I'm one of the pastors here we're gonna jump into some announcements who's ready for announcements all right we've got uh, if you guys didn't know we have an app a church app. It's called Reach. And if you just look it up in the app store, you'll see it. It's a great app to have. We have a Bible reader on there that will track along with the sermon and a place for you guys to take notes. So if you don't have it, download it. You will also see on the Reach app a ton of upcoming events. In fact, this April, we've got a slide for all these amazing events. Look at those events right there. We've got stuff for kids. Uh, We have a crazy craft day on April 13th. Uh, On April 14th, we are launching Alpha. Now, if you don't know what Alpha is, it is for those who are new to faith or exploring faith. And it takes place around a uh, table conversation over a film series. So if you're interested in that, uh, please talk to someone here. We'd love to have you be a part of Alpha. Then we've got Open House. Open House is for people who are new to Reach. You've maybe been coming a little bit, checking us out. We'd love to get to know you at Open House. It will take place on April 14th in the Commons. Um, It's going to be a great way for you to get to know the staff, maybe get plugged in to serve, see what we're all about. Uh, And then we've got stuff for men and women here at Reach. We've got a men's breakfast, April 20th, and April 27th, a ladies' connect. So be sure to put those on the calendar. Uh, One of the biggest things we want to do here at Reach is uh, be a place for community, for you to get plugged in and not just meet people at church, but make lifelong friends who you can walk out faith with. And then on April 28th, we've got child dedications. So if you have a little one that you want to dedicate to the Lord, You'd love to get up here in front of the church and have the church uh, bless them and pray over them. We'd love to have you guys do that with us. And then lastly, we want to thank all of you guys who have been giving faithfully. Uh, We believe here at Reach there are certain actions that we do that aren't just actions of obedience, but they're formative. They create in us a person that looks like Jesus. And giving is one of those things. As you give your tithes and offerings, we believe that it creates a heart that is worshipful towards Jesus and loves Jesus more than you love your money and possessions. So we just want to thank you and encourage you, those of you who are continuing to give. It blesses us and it partners with what the Lord is doing in the church here. Uh, Lastly, we have a little alpha teaser for those of you who are interested in it. So if you turn your attention to the screen, we're going to jump into that. Every day, we are inundated with so much information. Yet so many questions remain. How can I find my purpose? Why am I here? What should I believe? How can I find peace? Why is life so unfair? How can I thrive in challenging times? How can I make the most of my life? These are life's big questions, but there's rarely enough time to think them through properly. If you live to be 70, you're going to spend 20 years and three months asleep, 10 years and five months watching TV, five years and nine months in some form of transportation, seven years and six months eating and drinking, why not spend less than 24 of them asking life's biggest questions and try out? Awesome. Good morning, everybody. Good to be with you today. Happy Sunday to you. My name is Sean. If we haven't met yet, I am one of the other pastors around here at Reach who also wears denim jackets on Sundays. So I was looking at your shoes even, man. We're like in uniform today. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> Hey, uh, I am so glad you joined us. Um, If you're visiting with us today, welcome. Um, We're on the tail end of Easter Sunday, man. Wasn't Easter awesome if you were here last week? Goodness, we had such a good weekend. We had three services. 800 people joined us last Sunday. It was bonkers. 
um, and really, really fun. Um, just love seeing the hospitality, seeing people get connected, and, um, and I hope if you were around that that was a blessing to you. Thanks to everybody who served as well to pull that off. Amazing job, team. Way to go. Um, if you've got your Bibles with you, can you open up to Matthew chapter 12 this morning? We are going to be starting a brand new series back in the Gospel of Matthew, and the series title is simple. It's called Stretch Out Your Hand. Stretch Out Your Hand. Now, this is going to make sense based on what I preached through this morning and the story that we're looking at today, but big picture, I think it actually really fits well with who we are as a church. Uh, you may have discovered this, that we are a church that's called Reach. And the reason for this is maybe not what you think. A lot of people think that just assumes that everything we're going to do is always outside the doors. And yes, that is part of our mission is to be generous and, and missional outside of our doors. But the reason we're really called reach is because God has reached his hand out to us. It's about what he has done for us. We believe that through Jesus, God is reaching out to each and every one of us so that we can have a relationship with him because he loves us. And yes, we want to be a church that reaches our friends and goes outside of the kingdom or outside of this, this little mini kingdom out into the rest of the world and invite people into the kingdom. But the purpose of the church is not fueled by the mission itself. Rather, it's fueled by a deep, abiding connection to God that fuels the mission. See, Jesus has the ability to restore even the broken parts of us. He's still doing a work in our lives and healing dimensions of our lives that maybe we didn't even realize needed a touch from God. And what you're going to see throughout Matthew 12 is that Jesus is constantly inviting people, including the most hard-hearted individuals, to experience the transformation that he offers, but they're, gonna, they're not going to see it. They're going to miss it. They're going to oppose him time and time again. Some of them will stretch out their hand in response to Jesus, like the man that we're going to encounter in our study today. Other people will keep him at arm's length and might even plot to kill him. And my hope is that throughout this series that we won't only see Jesus and what he desires for us to be, um, but ultimately that we will respond. We will stretch out our hands to him. So let's dive in together. If you're able, will you please stand and let's read the word of God together. Matthew chapter 12, we're looking at 14 verses today. It says this, at that time, Jesus passed through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick and eat some heads of grain. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, See, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Haven't you read what David did when he and those who were with him were hungry? How they entered the house of God and they ate the bread of the presence. Which is, not, which is not lawful for him or for those with him to eat, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that on Sabbath days the priests in the temple violate the Sabbath or are innocent? I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what it means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath." Moving on from there, he entered the synagogue. There he saw a man who had a shriveled hand, and in order to accuse him, they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He replied to them, who among you, if he had a sheep that fell into a pit on the Sabbath, wouldn't take hold of it and lift it out? A person is worth far more than a sheep, so it is, it is lawful to do what is good on the Sabbath. Then he told the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out and was restored as good as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might kill him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And everyone said, amen. Amen. You can have a seat. David Wilkerson, the author of The Cross and the Switchblade and the former pastor of Times Square Church, said this. 
He said, at its heart, legalism is a desire to appear holy. It is trying to be justified before men and not God. It's interesting how often humans default to legalism, isn't it? If you think about it, inside the church, the temptation to become legalistic is always in front of us. The temptation to criticize those who don't do church the way that we do church or don't prefer, whether it's music styles, wearing casual clothes versus Sunday best, attendance records, all kinds of things you could come up with depending on the church, but you'll find that in many contexts, legalism has creeped in. But it's not just the church that struggles with this. I actually think the world struggles with this too. They wouldn't call it this. It might not be their language, but I believe that the world, the unbelieving world also struggles with legalism. Think about it this way. Have you ever met a legalistic person who is so militant about their ideology or agenda that if you don't affirm this or that, you're going to get canceled? People have literally lost their jobs because they wouldn't bow the knee or kiss the ring of their employers over some issue they were pushing. If we're fair about the human condition, if we're fair about our experience as people, the reality is people are people inside and outside the church. And in both cases, it becomes very easy to miss God's priorities when we elevate a particular agenda or preference past the point of obsession rather than seeking to understand what's right from the start. And it seems in this story, in the context of Jesus' life, around every turn, he's encountering these quote-unquote religious legalists who are more concerned about him doing the right things or the perceived right things the way they understood them to be rather than understanding what God truly wanted for his people. And we get a glimpse of this during a few encounters that Jesus and his disciples have with the Pharisees, those religious leaders of the day. Now, a little context on who these people are and kind of what's happening in the story at this point. For much of Jesus' ministry, he's had plenty of critics. And, you know, they would call him names. They would get frustrated with him. They'd bicker about him and, and, and be frustrated with different ways that he was acting. But the intensity is growing increasingly hostile towards Jesus. In fact, now we'll begin to see them strategizing his imminent execution. And ultimately, they will do anything it takes to get there, even if it means ignoring the overt miracles and teachings that he's performing and sharing right in front of them. So let's go back and let's see how this plays out and, and see what we can learn from a story like this. Now, before we talk about anything miraculous per se, uh, we enter a scene that's honestly pretty mundane. <laughs> it's a pretty laissez-faire situation we find ourselves in in verse 1. This is what it tells us, that Jesus passed through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry, so they began to pick and eat some heads of grain. Big deal, right? <laughs> Wahoo! They're eating some snacks. And yet this seems to be a point of contention, the Pharisees took seriously a uh, serious issue with this. And why? Because they were doing this on the Sabbath day. They confront Jesus in verse two, verse 2. It says, see, your disciples are doing what is unlawful to do on the Sabbath. Now, if you're unfamiliar with kind of this context or even what Sabbath means, let me just give you a little, little snapshot Sabbath comes from the Greek or the, the Hebrew word rather, Shabbat, which means to cease or to rest. This was one of the commandments that God gave out of the creation narrative. On the seventh day, God rested, and so he bakes us into the Ten Commandments as well, that we should rest every six days, and on the seventh day, rest. That means that we stop doing things like working. One day a week, rest, recoup, and in particular, remember God's goodness. That sounds pretty reasonable and awesome, doesn't it? Seems like a good thing to do. But as time went on, the Jewish teachers of the day took this to a whole new level. In fact, during that time, there were at least 39 different classes of work that you were supposed to avoid. 
So it wasn't just don't go to your work that day. It was like, here's all kinds of physical labor that you should not do. On top of that, they had 613 commandments plus additional uh, supplemental laws that they created just to help them keep the the 613 commandments. Like, okay, 613 is, is not enough. We need to create some extra ones so that we don't mess up those ones. Essentially, your entire life was obsessing over not doing something wrong. Now, some of you grew up in a household like that, and you're in therapy for it. God bless you. I'm not going to heap more burden on you today. But needless to say, it got pretty legalistic. And in this case, they took deep issue with the disciples merely picking some grain and eating it. And the reason for this, the reason they thought this was breaking the law is because in Jewish law, harvesting was considered a form of work and thus prohibited on the Sabbath. And so they interpreted their gleaning of a few pieces of grain as harvesting. Therefore, they were breaking Sabbath. But here's the deal. It actually wasn't a violation. It wasn't a violation. In fact, there is a permission granted in the scriptures for things like this. Uh, The scripture even had instructions for people like farmers to section off areas of their crops specifically for travelers and the poor. Deuteronomy 23, 25 instructs those people who might pass through a farm this way. It says, if you enter a neighbor's grain field, you may pluck heads of grain with your hand, but you must not put a sickle to your neighbor's grain. In other words, feel free to take a little snack. Just don't fill your backpack on the way. (laughs) Just be mindful, respect your neighbor's property, leave something for everybody else, but they're also gonna be generous towards you. If that's the case, then Jesus never violated God's law about the Sabbath, nor any law that God had prescribed, and he never permitted his disciples to do so either. But the Pharisees were so obsessed with trapping Jesus that they couldn't see clearly how they had inflated the law past the point of necessity, hence completely missing the point of the law. See, their faith was so entwined with rule following that they overlooked the core purpose of the law, which was God's way of setting his people apart to be distinct and different, to protect them from the trappings trappings of a secular society, not to beat themselves over the head and everybody else with it. See, I think for many of us, be it because we're maybe not self-aware of how we live our lives or perceive ourselves, or maybe at times we even just feel guilty about not being more on top of our faith, if you will. I think sometimes we can gravitate towards compensating with good works and good behavior and good optics. And the temptation oftentimes is to scrutinize other people and their faith when they're not living up to the standard that we think that they should. To scrutinize others, maybe to just make ourselves feel superior. Think about it this way. You never miss a Sunday, but you're a terrible neighbor. (laughs) Or you're a parent who enforces a strict Bible reading on your children, but you are constantly losing your your temper on them. Or maybe you're a small group leader who's quick to correct other people's theology and behavior, but you refuse to let anyone else speak into your life. Or perhaps, a hot button issue, you're a husband who lords your leadership over your wife, demanding submission, but you don't display the self-sacrificial love and care that a godly leader should. There's inconsistencies here. These are all examples of adhering to a particular part of the law, yet missing the point of it. If you're a note taker, here's something you can write down this morning. One of the biggest obstacles to following Jesus is taking hold of a system rather than the Savior. We can get so fixated on doing the right thing, on nickel and diming each other on the law that we miss the heart of the law to begin with, which is relationship with God. To be a set-apart people, 
to be, to be a people who spur each other on, not a people who tear each other down. See, the Pharisees trusted the system. The disciples trusted Jesus. The Pharisees thought highly of themselves, but the, the disciples were growing in humility before Jesus. The Pharisees couldn't see the Messiah, but the disciples trusted the Messiah even unto death. Before we go any further, I just ask you this question. Where in your life have you allowed a legalistic heart to cloud your judgment on how you're actually doing? We have to be so careful that we don't rest on our ability to follow a religious system without allowing the Savior to shape us and mold us into godly people who are truly changed. Now, we'll talk later about the importance of the system and, and, and a way that we should be interacting with the system, uh, not to thwart it and not to throw it out entirely, but we need to get that right, that we are called to trust the Savior, not just the system. And so Jesus responds to this legalism uh, and, and this posture of the Pharisees pretty straightforward. He says this in verse 3, haven't you heard what David did when he and those who were with him were hungry? How he entered the house of God and they ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for him or for those with him to eat, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read it in the law that on the Sabbath days, the priests in the temple violate the Sabbath and are innocent? What's he talking about here? He's pointing out their inconsistencies even to their own adherence to the law. This is an interesting summary from David Platt in his commentary. He says this, that Jesus cited the Old Testament story of David entering the tabernacle and eating a piece of bread with his men on the Sabbath, something that only the priests were permitted to do. And side note, uh, the reason he brings this up is because they loved David. The Pharisees loved David. They idolized David. They worshiped the ground he effectively walked on. And so Jesus is making this case, well, if this guy that you adhere to and that you love so dearly would do this, then what's your issue? Jesus then noted how the priests were, according to the law, allowed to what? Work on the Sabbath without dishonoring God. In other words, the rules that the Pharisees were making would not even stand up with precedent in the Old Testament, the very same Old Testament they were seeking to uphold. And so if David was permitted to eat this showbread, if the priests were allowed to work on the Sabbath, then how much more would the disciples be permitted to pick a little bit of grain when granted permission by Jesus? It seems so minuscule in comparison, and yet they're living so, inconsistent, so inconsistently with their own laws. Tony Evans beautifully adds this. He says that Scripture itself testifies that God's laws were never meant to get in the way of taking care of the necessities of life. The Sabbath was for the benefit of man, not for his destruction. I think we have to keep this in mind, especially those of us who are in kind of a foundation building phase right now of our faith, that there is a greater goal of Christianity than simply understanding the Bible, as much as that is incredibly important for you to do. There's a greater goal than checking boxes or making sure you don't break rules. There's a greater goal, and the greater goal is this, knowing and walking hand in hand with the one who set the rules in place to begin with. That is the point. That is the target, the reason why we would approach anything God has commanded us with joy and gladness. Think about it this way. This is my wife, Kara, on the front row. Hi. Morning. Morning. Hope your drive-in was good. We never drive in together, by the way. I'm always like two hours earlier than her. So um, I can know a lot about Kara. I do know a lot about Kara. I can know a lot about her by looking at her Facebook page and her Instagram. And you probably could too if you're friends with her. 
I can know a lot about Kara by looking at the books that she reads in the last two years, by looking at shows she likes to watch, by looking at how she spends our money. I can learn a lot about my wife through these behaviors, but does that mean, amen. <laughs> does that mean that I know my wife? If I know things about Kara, does that mean that I know Kara? No, it absolutely doesn't. You could, you could observe her on social media, I could observe her on social media, and we can know the exact same things, but that doesn't mean that we know her in the same way. And in the same way, just because you know things about God does not mean that you know him. Just because you know factoids from the Bible doesn't mean that you are in an abiding relationship with the God of the Bible. And Jesus is putting these religious leaders on notice, telling them that though they know some things about God, they've missed the point of what's been written to begin with. They've made their entire faith about following the rules and all the happenings within the temple, but they've failed to address the sinfulness of their own hearts. And he's got words for them. Verse 6 says this, I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what this means, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you'd have not condemned the innocent. See, the Pharisees held on to the law and their own traditions and their place of worship as an act, an ultimate act of worship. They looked at the temple and the law as, as the be-all, end-all of the execution of their faith. But what is Jesus saying? Something better is here. Something better. Someone better is here. Better than the temple. Greater than the law. Jesus is teeing them up to reveal more of who he is to them. But they were hard-hearted, weren't they? See, in their minds, Jesus was desecrating both the law and the temple because their faith was so tied into things like the rules and the building. Here's the scary, weird thing for us. Contextually, in 2024, in Everett, Washington, we can be tempted to do the same thing. Our temptation to elevate the sanctity of a church building or our temptation to rest on the laurels of our good behavior as primary drivers for allegiance to Jesus are not that much different from the religious leaders back then. Said another way, faith that depends on perfection and or location results in legalism and pride ultimately missing the heart of the gospel. It does. It does because we, we conflate things that God gave us as gifts into the seat of authority. And I think that's why we feel so much tension in our world, in, in this cultural context that we live in with things like buildings. Because in one sense, some of us will swing in here and we'll feel like everything that God is doing is always happening in this building alone. And others of us will say, church isn't a building, it's a people. And we'll almost get kind of like off put by buildings and, and quote unquote institutions. And we wanna throw the whole thing out entirely. See, there's just this, this weird tension that we find ourselves in, and I get it, I understand it, because I've lived through both of those tensions plenty of times throughout my life. I think they both missed the point. Elevating the building, throwing the building away. I think they both missed the point. They both can produce legalism. They both can produce pride and elitism, thinking that we know better than what God has given us. The building is just a tool to get us all in the same room together. The building is a tool for ministry. But God, you're right, God's presence is not limited to this room, to this space. He indwells within believers. And so here's something that maybe they missed back then, but we don't have to miss today, that God is not bound up in a physical location nor is his grace contingent on your or my ability to keep the rules. Something greater than the temple is here. 
And if you've built your faith on performance or showing up on a Sunday or what happens in this specific facility, then you're missing out on the greater thing. The greater thing is Jesus. Don't miss the main event. Don't miss the main course, the, the, the main character. Don't miss Jesus. But what this means is our motivation for obedience is not to achieve relationship. It's rather in response to relationship. Our motivation is totally different now. I, I appreciate the, the words of Jen Wilkin on this topic. She says this, that while legalism builds self-righteousness, lawfulness builds righteousness. Obedience to the law is the means of sanctification for the believer. What is she saying here? She's saying we're not trying to puff up our sense of self-righteousness by adhering to certain traditions or principles or laws. No, what we're doing is we're saying, God, I want to snap in to your design for my life because I want to grow with you. It's a totally different motivation. It's like, God, I want what you have for me. And I revere you enough to say, I'll do what you ask of me. I'll be a part of the body of Christ because you've called me to be a part of the body of Christ. I'll use my gifts because I know you've called me to use my gifts. I'll cut certain things out of my life, certain sins or lifestyles or behaviors or thought processes because I want to be in step with who you've designed me to be. The motivation is different. It's not checking boxes. It's not about a facility. It's about a reverent, obedient relationship to Jesus. And Jesus tells them he's not after empty sacrifice. He's after a faithful relationship and love with God that expresses itself through mercy towards others. That's a reference from Hosea 6.6 6 that he's calling on. And so then Jesus goes and he, he, he raised the stakes even higher with this next statement. Verse 8, he says this to them. He says, For the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. So he's not just telling them, hey, I've got some opinions on Sabbath. No, he's actually speaking from a position of authority. The Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. That title, Son of Man, is one that Jesus often uses to refer to himself in that title, he's hearkening back to Daniel 7, a prophetic word that was given about the Messiah who would come, describing him as a son of man. And Jesus uses that to remind even his, old te or his, uh, his Jewish audience of readings that they would have been uh, akin to. That he's saying, I am that son of man. I am that Messiah you have been longing for and waiting for. Therefore, I have the authority to define the terms of the Sabbath. I had a chance to visit Israel uh, back in 2016. I've mentioned this before. Um, and I was there over a Sabbath. And it was interesting because the town literally shuts down for a solid 24 hours. I mean, you could do stuff. But generally speaking, a lot of the things that you'd be able to do, you cannot do. In fact, in our hotel room, uh, they had a wall of elevators, um, all with buttons. But one of them said Sabbath elevator. And that elevator was one that just the doors openly opened and closed automatically. You didn't have to push a button. I almost got on it one time and somebody said, stop, don't go in that elevator. I said, why? They said, because that's the Sabbath elevator. I said, Shabbat Shalom, let's go. And they said, no, no, don't go on that elevator because if you get on it, you, you won't have to push a button, but it's going to stop at every floor and open the doors. <laughs> so you know, however many 15 floors or whatever, you're just sitting there, you have to wait for every single time. Why? Because they felt like even to push the button was work or would make the elevator work. Therefore, we're not going to push the button. We're just going to let the elevator run its course and we'll just wait until we get to the floor we need to. <laughs> it's wild. It's wild. And it didn't, it didn't feel like a, a spiritual act to me. It just felt like a, a logistic they were trying not to mess up, Right? See, Jesus reframes this whole mentality. For his disciples, picking grain and eating it is good. Don't, he's not going to stress over this. They're not breaking the Sabbath law. The Sabbath was made for their good, and it's made for our good. It's made for connection with God. Now, 
What about when it comes to serving somebody on the Sabbath? What if, what if helping somebody requires working a little bit to help them? Is that permitted? You know, you're practicing Sabbath and your friend needs help moving. Are you breaking the Sabbath if you do that? Well, to inconvenience, in, to inconvenience yourself um, may be something that could take place on a Sabbath, and Jesus shows them how. Verse nine, uh, verse 9 says this, moving on from there, he entered their synagogue, so like their local church parish. There he saw a man who had a shriveled hand, and in order to accuse him, hear that? Now we start to see what's actually happening here. It's not just that they're rule followers. They actually have a agenda behind these questions. In order to accuse him, they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? In Luke 6, there's a par parallel account of this story, and it says that the man with a paralyzed hand or withered hand, uh, that it was his right hand. And in that culture, the dominant hand was the right one, which would suggest that this man's working hand would have been damaged. His dominant hand probably would have been used vocationally was damaged. And so the Pharisees are taking this opportunity for more entrapment of Jesus, they, but they see the man as a prop. They don't care about him. They don't care about his livelihood. They don't care about his healing. They just want to trip Jesus up on the Sabbath. Verse 11, he replied to them, who among you, if he had a sheep that fell into a pit on the Sabbath, wouldn't take hold of it and lift it out? A person is worth far more than a sheep. So it is lawful to do what is good on the Sabbath. Once again, there's all kinds of laws in Exodus and Deuteronomy that talk about when an animal's in jeopardy, that you can make sure the animal's okay on the Sabbath. And Jesus is saying, if that's okay, how much more important is it to care for other people? <laughs> Clearly, Jesus wasn't part of PETA. Just kidding, sorry, that was so unnecessary. <laughs> but look what happens. Look what happens. Verse 13, then he told the man, stretch out your hand. Isn't it funny? He tells the paralyzed man to do something he couldn't do. Is it possible he was going to enable the man to do it? Stretch out your hand. So he stretches it out, and it was restored as good as the other. It's powerful. It's powerful. Think about how emotional that would be for that man to regain his ability to use that hand. I mean, we read it and we're like, whoa, cool miracle. For him, life changed. Completely different story. What took Jesus a few words has redirected the course of this man's entire life. And everybody sees it. Everybody sees it. And so not only now have we seen Jesus talk about the Sabbath, declare he's Lord over the Sabbath, now he's doing miraculous work on the Sabbath. And everybody sees it. The Pharisees see this whole thing playing out right in front of them. What is Jesus doing here? Jesus is demonstrating that he is the highest authority over both morality and creation. He's making an immense declaration in both word and deed about who he is and what he stands for. He is the highest morality over both moral, the highest authority over both morality and creation. Uh, just think about this for a second. Keeping the Sabbath is number four of the Ten Commandments. And even in our modern times, I think if people have no regard for the Bible or little exposure to it, most people have at least enough of a working knowledge to say either the Ten Commandments or the Golden Rule are somewhat important in society, right? Like, people are like, oh, the Ten Commandments, that's what I know about the Bible, or the Golden Rule, yeah, love your neighbor as yourself, great. These are like the most common forms of good found in Scripture, but the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament was also the highest level of law and authority in the entire Torah. And Jesus comes along and he declares, 
I am Lord over even this level of commandment. I am the highest authority on morality, and watch this, also over creation too. I can command disorder in the physical body to come into order. Now, I think if we're honest, some of us struggle with a few of these concepts. One, the idea that Jesus would get to dictate our views on morality. I think this is just something that we're finding in our culture at large right now. It's a tension we all face. You might struggle with the idea that Jesus would have an opinion on what you do for work or on your sexuality or whether or not your job permits you to fellowship with other believers or if certain forms of entertainment are okay or not okay or how intentionally you should be raising your kids, or how you should use your money. The list goes on and on. Well, guess what? He's got an opinion. Scripture has an opinion. Many of those opinions came directly from Jesus' mouth, and they're in red letters in your Bible, many of your Bibles. Many of the other opinions that he has, the Holy Spirit inspired the biblical authors to write for our good. And for the areas that aren't explicitly laid out, we should still do our best while diligently studying the word of God in the context of community and and, and learning together. We should do our best to make decisions with the intention of pleasing God, not out of selfish motivation or fleshly motivation. Now, for some of you, though, maybe the idea that Jesus is Lord over creation is challenging. That means even your own physical body or somebody else that you know, perhaps. Here's here's the honest truth. Uh, Why he heals some and and not others, I don't know. You know, we, we read about a lot of amazing healings that Jesus does in Scripture, but surely he doesn't heal everyone. And no doubt, I am what you would call a continuationist. I do believe that Jesus still heals I do believe in the gifts of the Spirit. I have seen him move in supernatural, miraculous ways and have also seen him not in ways that I was hoping. But here's what I know. Jesus is still Lord of all creation. He's still Lord of all creation. And we may not know or understand why he moves the way he does for some and not others, but we can still ask him to intervene. And we can still trust him And in the case of the man with the withered hand, he moved. And in other situations, he doesn't. But we need to remember that the point of this healing was not for the man to say, hey, hey, everybody, check out what happened. And for Jesus to say, hey, everybody, look at this cool party trick. That wasn't the point. The point was to validate his authority over morality and creation. He was validating his messiahship through his works. If that's not enough for some of you in the room today, I want to just give you a little hope and encouragement this morning. The Apostle Paul, I believe, offers great courage uh, in his letter to the church in Corinth. Um, Remember, the Apostle Paul, um, he's been on several missionary journeys, and he's doing all kinds of great stuff for the Lord, but he begins facing severe hardship, including persecution and physical distress. And he describes what he would call a thorn in his flesh that he begs God to remove. This nuisance, a lot of people speculate, was this an addiction? Was this a belief? Was this a person that just nagged him? Was this a circumstance he found him in? We don't really know what he meant by the thorn in his flesh, but he asks God many times to remove it and, it, and it doesn't get removed. And so Paul says, my, the Lord spoke to him and said, my grace is sufficient and my power is made perfect even in your weakness. He receives a little dose of grace. Listen to his perspective as he navigates all these painful things. He says this, So, we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. 
this is what I love about this statement. And one of the most incredible things about navigating life hand in hand with God is this. That even in the midst of life's most difficult challenges, Paul describes them, what? As light and momentary troubles in comparison to the eternal glory he is looking forward to. Can you believe this? Arguably, he's going through worse stuff than probably most or if all of us have ever gone through. And yet here he is calling these shackles, these chains, these thorns, what have you, light and momentary struggles because he understands the hope of glory. Because he's fixed his eyes and his gaze on Jesus and he knows where his ultimate healing is coming from. This particular story concludes with a man being healed. And then the Pharisees are super stoked and they're like, oh, we were wrong, Jesus. You're so awesome, right? No, not even, not even close. Verse 14 is probably the most sobering of this entire passage. After all that we just read and talked about, it says, but the Pharisees went out and they plotted against him how they might kill him. Is that shocking to anybody? Surprising to us that, that people could see the Messiah, uh, could see so much evidence of authority and it's all net positive. What's the worst thing that just happened? Some people filled their bellies and a dude got healed. And they're mad about it. That miracle didn't prompt adoration or worship. It prompted contempt. And so what this tells us is they haven't just misunderstood the law, they have weaponized the law against Jesus. They're standing in opposition to him now. Friends, here's something you need to understand is that seeing doesn't always mean believing. Seeing doesn't always mean believing. To, to think seeing God put his power on full display would be enough proof to trust him is a fallacy because even the Pharisees rejected Jesus after witnessing such events. Here's what we're called to. Much like Jesus told his disciples post-resurrection, Blessed, blessed is the one who sees and believes, but even more so is the one who doesn't see and believes. And oftentimes, only those who experience a heart-level miracle, transformation, repentance from sin, trusting that he is who he says he is, those are the ones who will believe and will understand and will truly be transformed. I want to read one last quote to you before we conclude this morning. This quote really rattled me when I read it, and, and, and I, it may not rattle you the same way it did for me, but it just stirred my heart, and I've been thinking about it since I read it this week. It's from Michael Green from his book, The Message of Matthew, The Kingdom of Heaven. He says, why was it, why is it, that so many people reject the most powerful person who has ever walked this earth? Is that Amber Alert? I rebuke you, Satan. Reading a good quote. I'm on airplane mode. I didn't get it. <laughs> I'll give you a sec to silence your phone. <laughs> Just let her ride here, guys. <laughs> Can I read it to you one more time? Why was it why is it that so many people reject the most wonderful person who ever walked this earth? I mean, is, is it not crazy to think about? For all Jesus did, for all he accomplished in his life and his death and resurrection, how readily people reject him. Isn't it crazy how in our own hearts we reject him at times? We, we take for granted the, the goodness of God and the things that he's done for us. Isn't it crazy to you 
Isn't it crazy to think that Jesus could go all the way to the cross, die a death we deserve, rise from the dead, extend and stretch out his hand to us, and we would just be so indifferent towards it. It blows my mind. Listen, as we prepare to worship, as the band begins to just usher us into a time of worship this morning, I want you to reflect on this, that God made the rules and he made the commandments and he calls us to an abiding relationship for our good. But in our sin, we disobey. In our sin, we're trapped with this sickness, this disease, spiritual, emotional, physical, that we cannot escape ourselves. And for centuries, people thought that God, uh, fulfilling the law of God and obeying the commands was enough, but it wasn't enough. It missed relationship. And Jesus came to set the record straight to demonstrate that he is the healer, he is our authority, he is our eternal hope. He stretched out his hand, and many of you have taken it. Praise God. Many of you are yet to take it. I would encourage you this way. He is stretching out his hand to you today. And he's asking you in response to reach back out to him, to take hold of his hand, to trust him, to know that you don't have to strive for your salvation. You will never be a perfect person. You will struggle to accept certain things he asks of you. But he's God. He loves you. And if he's asking you to do something or be a certain way, it's not because he's a tyrant and he's just got pet peeves about how you're living your life. It's because he wants you to live into his design for flourishing. And he wants your life to be a reflection of worship unto him. And he wants your life to be put on display for the world so people can see the glory of God in you and through you. We gotta take his hand. We gotta take his hand. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this morning. And I thank you so much that you initiated with us. God, I, I thank you that you stretched out to your, your hand to us first. And Lord, I thank you that you enable us in our brokenness by your grace through faith to reach out our hands towards you and trust you. God, may today and every day we be a church, we be a people who walk closely with you who don't mistake behavior modification, who don't mistake good, good behavior or good optics for true faith. But God, may we be a people who are set apart, who walk closely with you, close enough to understand your voice, close enough to desire your commands to manifest in our lives. I just wonder, this is a little different than normal. Um, I want, uh, some of you might need to take a step towards or with Jesus this morning, and, and I wanna give you a chance to do that, and then I'm gonna tell you how you can do that. But I just feel like in the room today, there could be people here who, maybe you are struggling to trust Jesus holistically in your life. And so you manage, you manage how people see you pretty darn well, but you feel like your soul's rotting. You feel really empty, you feel really discouraged, you feel like you're going through the religious motions, but you just don't feel like you are connected to the heart of God as you do them. I'm gonna raise my hand with you, because that's me some days. But if that is you, I wanna pray with you 
that God will just touch you today, touch your heart, draw you into abiding relationship. Can you put your hand up if that's you, if you feel that today? I just am striving in my flesh to perform. I'm striving in my flesh to modify my life. I'm striving to trust, but I just don't feel it in my heart. Lord, thank you for honest hearts today who I believe genuinely want to trust you and to abide in a relationship with you, but they're struggling because maybe how they're wired, maybe because of their upbringing, maybe what they've learned in, in the church over the years. Maybe, whatever it is, God, you know their story. I just speak grace and peace over you. His grace is sufficient. His power is made perfect in your weakness. And it is by grace that you are saved through faith. God, will you minister to these hearts this morning? Build them up, God, like a good father. Jesus, the way you protected your disciples, will you protect their hearts from the attacks of the enemy, the accuser, would try to condemn them for not being perfect today. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. If you're somebody who's in the room today and you'd say, I want to surrender my life to Jesus. I, I have not been walking with Jesus. There's a, a bold step I want you to take today. And I would love for you to come up and receive prayer with somebody and to confess with your mouth what you're beginning to believe in your heart. I'm going to have prayer team members on the left and the right who are available to you. They'd love to come pray with you and to just encourage you uh, to take that step with Jesus today. If you're somebody here today who would say, I, I still have some questions about that, will you let us know on your Connect card you got questions about what it, means, what it means to follow Jesus? And we'd love to talk to you about that and just try to answer any questions you have. Write it out on the Connect card, give us contact, and we'll respond to you this week. For the rest of us, will you stand this morning? We're going to sing, we're going to worship, we're going to receive communion together. If you're a follower of Jesus, we take communion up front here. We will walk up front during this next song, take some bread, dip it in the juice. Uh, this is for people who would consider themselves followers of Jesus. So come on up front and do that. And let's respond and worship this morning. Let's, let's not be caught up in the sense of having to prove to everybody that we love to worship. <laughs> let's just worship God. Right? Just easy yoke stuff. Just open your heart before him and give him the praise he's due. Amen? Amen. Let's sing. And all things have passed away. Your love has stayed the same. Your constant grace remains the cornerstone. Things that we thought were dead are breathing in life again. You cause your son.
so much for who you are because you first loved us we can love you Lord I pray that you would lead us from this place into our lives and I pray that we would have you ever on our mind I pray that you would influence us to love the people around us to love Everett whatever cities we're coming from may we be people that looks like Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, let's, let's also really quickly, uh, <laughs> I, I turn my phone on, I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, sounds like there's a missing 10-year-old boy. Is that what you guys saw too? Um, on your Amber Alert? Let's just pray real quick, if you guys are cool with that. Just pray for the family, pray for that child. Lord, we pray that you would protect this child. We don't know the circumstance. We don't know what's going on. We don't know uh, just so much context around these, these little blips of information we get. But Lord, you know, you see holistically what's happening. So we pray that you would protect this child. God, we ask that you would give comfort to the family, that you would reunite them quickly. God, will you use the authorities to help bring this child home? 
ultimately protect them from anything that would cause them harm. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. Thanks for being here today, you guys. If you're visiting with us today, we're so glad you came. Come a few times, uh, hang out, get to know some people. Stop by also the welcome bar on your way out. There's a free gift out there for you. We just wanna say thanks for coming and uh, just give, give you something to bless you today. Uh, for the rest of us, have a great Sunday and we'll see you soon.